How do we eat the air around us? This is a weird question, right? As we don't eat the air, we breathe it in. By breathing air in, we can obtain oxygen, which is used for aerobic respiration. Respiration produces ATP, which is required for the energy requiring metabolic processes that occur in our body, such as movement. How can we eat air though? Unless we're referring to the substances that make up air. I believe we can tackle this question from two viewpoints. Either we can analyze what the air is composed of, or we can analyze what our food consists of. Air, as we all know, is a mixture of gases. One of these gases is in fact nitrogen, and it's the most abundant by far, making up around 78% of air. The next abundant gas is oxygen, making up around 21% of air. Let's start with nitrogen and how we eat it. At first it sounds like a ridiculous claim, but let's try and prove it. Nitrogen in the air seems useless. You would think that humans do not use it, and it just happens to be present on Earth in large quantities. This is not bad reasoning, as the nitrogen atoms in nitrogen molecules, also denoted as N2, are held together by a strong, triple covalent bond, and this bond requires a lot of energy to overcome. As a chemical reaction requires bond breaking and bond making, this makes nitrogen relatively chemically inert or unreactive under room temperature and pressure, and this property would have made it hard to be integrated into biological systems over time. However, there is evidence of certain bacteria involving this inert nitrogen in the air in their chemical reactions. Bacteria belonging to the genus Azotobacter convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonium ions using the enzyme nitrogenase. We call this nitrogen fixation. This may be a useful stepping stone for us in our journey to reveal the answer to our question. Before we get into the intricate scientific details of this route, we can take into account our second viewpoint where we analyse what our food consists of. What we eat comes from plants or animals, so if we are to find out how we eat the nitrogen that comes from the air, we should follow how it comes to be in plants and animals first. If we look down every food chain, however, they always start with a producer or a plant, which animals eat and obtain their source of nitrogen from, so this narrows our search down to only observing what happens in plants. I mentioned earlier that ammonium ions are released into the soil by certain nitrogen fixing bacteria. Now, plain ammonium ions cannot be absorbed by plants directly as it will kill them. Therefore, we need to convert them into a less harmful nitrogen containing substance in order to be absorbed. We can use even more bacteria to carry this out. Ammonia oxidizing bacteria, such as the ones belonging to the genus Nitrosomonas, oxidize ammonium ions into nitrite ions and then nitrite oxidizing bacteria such as the ones belonging to the genus Nitrospira oxidize the nitrite ions produced into nitrate ions. If you're scratching your head over what the term oxidation means, do not worry. It's essentially the loss of electrons to another species. There is an alternative way of fixing the nitrogen in the air into nitrate ions. What else could harness enough energy to break the triple bond in a nitrogen molecule? The answer is lightning. An average lightning bolt can transfer 500 million joules of energy, and the amount of energy required to break the nitrogen bond is 941,000 joules per mole. With lightning striking the nitrogen molecules, we get homolytic bond fission occurring, where the nitrogen triple bond breaks evenly, producing two nitrogen free radicals with unpaired electrons. With an average lightning bolt, we can get up to 6.4 times 10 to the 26 nitrogen radicals. These radicals are very reactive and react with oxygen molecules to form various nitrogen oxides, for example nitrogen dioxide, which go on to react with water to form nitric acid and nitrous acid. These substances infiltrate the soil and with the help of bacteria become nitrates. Now we have nitrate ions, which are able to be absorbed by plants as they are non-toxic. Let's not forget the question in mind though, how is it this nitrogen ends up on our plate? Well, after the plant has absorbed the nitrate ions through its roots, it incorporates the nitrogen into various biological molecules, for example proteins, DNA and ATP. Focus on proteins though, as a lot of the nitrogen is going to be used to build proteins. Proteins are required for so many functions that occur in the body, they allow you to pick your nose whilst watching this video. Proteins are composed of long chains of amino acids linked by peptide bonds. And sometimes these chains are folded and held together by certain bonds to allow this protein to carry out a certain function. An amino acid is just a monomer and follows the basic structure of a carbon attached to a hydrogen, an amine group and a carboxyl group. 
As you can see, the nitrogen is contained within all amino acids. So we could just eat these plants and there we have our nitrogen that was once a gas in air, now as part of the lettuce on your plate. Now, if you're a non-vegetarian and like to have a chicken wing every once in a while, then you may be wondering how nitrogen comes to be in that succulent piece of meat. Let's say that the animal that is going to end up in our mouth eats plants. It would obviously obtain its nitrogen from the plants they eat. But how's it going to do that? If we follow the plant proteins, we can see that they end up in the animal's digestive system. And so they must be broken down into their substituent amino acids, which are smaller and more soluble so they can be absorbed. These consumers digest the proteins in the plants after consuming them with different enzymes. There are amino peptidases, which cleave single amino acids from the amino terminal of the polypeptide chain, and carboxypeptidases, which cleave single amino acids from the carboxylic end of a peptide. You even get endopeptidases, which hydrolyze the peptide bonds within the protein, producing smaller chains, and dipeptidases hydrolyze dipeptides into amino acids. These enzymes are present to maximize the rate at which proteins are digested. The primary consumer then absorbs the amino acids left behind, for example by co-transport if the primary consumer was a mammal. With amino acids left behind, we need to absorb them against their concentration gradient to get them into the bloodstream. To do this, we could use sodium ions and pump them out of cells lining the small intestine and into the bloodstream via a sodium potassium pump. Note that this is going to require energy and we can obtain it from the breakdown of ATP using water, also known as hydrolysis. With a now lower concentration of sodium ions in these cells than in the lumen, the inside of the gut, sodium ions can be transported into the cell via co-transporter protein. The co-transporter protein uses the energy from this gradient to transport amino acids into the cell from the lumen of their gut against their concentration gradient at the same time. The amino acids are then transported into the bloodstream via facilitated diffusion through carrier proteins. The amino acids can then be later incorporated into new proteins in a process called translation, which should be a topic for another video. This is repeated from consumer to consumer, and somewhere along the food chain, we are the consumer that has the nitrogen left on our plate. I mentioned earlier that bacteria and lightning fix nitrogen in the air into some form of nitrogenous compound, which are natural processes. They'll carry on doing it if we do not interfere with them. I haven't mentioned any artificial roots to your plate though. Just to give you the minimal satisfaction, I'll talk you through an example of a process carried out by industry. So we apply certain chemical fertilizers to fields, but where do we get the nitrogen containing substances in the fertilizer from? Well, at the beginning of the 20th century, a German chemist by the name of Fritz Haber developed an industrial technique whereby a mixture of nitrogen and hydrogen was manipulated to become ammonia with an iron catalyst under a high temperature and pressure. The ammonia was then implemented into fertilizer along with other mineral ions to be applied to fields. The ammonia would then be converted into nitrates by nitrifying bacteria and they would be absorbed by plants. With more fertilizer up to a certain point, the plants would have more nitrogen to build into proteins and grow and so crop yields would increase. We use this technique to this day and we call it the harbour process. It could probably explain why you're not starving at this very moment. Although. I cannot prove that. Alternatively, because the passage of nitrogen in the environment is a cycle, the plant, instead of being eaten, could be decomposed by saprobionts. Saprobionts are microorganisms that break down dead organic material. These saprobionts will break down the proteins in dead plants and convert them into ammonia. This ammonia is then nitrified, like I mentioned earlier, but I did not mention that there are two routes to where the nitrates could go. They may be reabsorbed by plants or they may be denitrified and converted back into nitrogen gas by denitrifying bacteria for the cycle to repeat. The cycle can revolve once more, resulting in nitrogen in the food on your plate. This means that nitrogen could have been circulating in the environment for millions of years before being part of your steak. Knowing also now that we already know, I could suggest that you were eating what was once part of the bacteria that perhaps lived in sewage water. You may have noticed that I've neglected the other substances in air, like carbon dioxide, oxygen and water, that we effectively eat going by the same principles as before. Well, carbon dioxide is converted into sugars by plants in a process called photosynthesis, which I believe is a topic for another video. Oxygen may be used in respiration and form water or carbon dioxide, 
where it then may join sugars in photosynthesis. Water in the air basically condenses, joins rivers and infiltrates the water table underneath the soil. It is absorbed by plant roots by osmosis and travels up the xylem into plant leaves where it is used for photosynthesis or various metabolic reactions. Animals can obtain water by drinking it from rivers, but with water, does it still count? What I mean is, can you eat water? Anyway, thanks for watching and goodbye.